Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for Eth Ethical Fabric Dyeing Workshop. So my name is Annabelle, I work in the recruitment and outreach team at NUA and I'll be online throughout this session today with Liv who is in the background and um, to make sure this session runs as smoothly as possible. So I'll be handing over very shortly to Mia Sylvia and she will be leading this workshop for you today. So just before we start we have a couple of house rules um, so we would be grateful if you could please ensure that your audio and video remains muted for the majority of this session. There will be some moments where we'd like to see your work and hear how you're getting on. So at those points, if you're happy to share your work, you can do by letting us know by just putting yes in the chat function and we'll give you permission to share your video and audio. Do make sure that there's nothing inappropriate in your background or anything that gives out anything personal about you. So we will be recording today's session, so please don't worry if you have any technical problems. We'll be making this available to you afterwards so you won't miss anything. Um, it is also worth bearing in mind that if you do share your video, it will be included in the recording that will circulate to all of those who attended. If Mia has any technical problems or their internet connection drops out, we'll try to reconnect for around five minutes before cancelling this session. Our apologies in advance if this happens, but we will send you a recording afterwards so that you can complete the workshop in your own time. We'll have the chat function open for today's session, but ask that you keep your messages in the open chat and do not message a fellow participant privately. Again, please also make sure not to give out any personal information about yourself. If you see or hear anything inappropriate or have any questions or concerns about the workshop or even your situation at home, please don't hesitate to message me privately or Liv who is under the name NUA Admin um, and will be on hand to help and assist you throughout the workshop. So during this particular workshop, you will be heating up water on the stove. So please be careful and ask the homeowner's permission. Please also wear an apron and rubber gloves so that the ingredients do not stain your hands or clothes. But Mia will be explaining this through the workshop as she goes along. So you can also pin Mia's video to follow the tutorial. So hopefully some of you might have used Zoom before, but you can pin an individual video as I know she's got a couple so we can see how she's working. So that's it from me for the moment. So I will hand over to Mia and we'll get going with today's session. Brilliant. Thank you for Annabelle. Hello everybody. My name is Mia. Um, I am a fashion and textiles designer um, from my own brand called Mia Sylvia. Today we're going to be learning how to dye fabric using organic matter that you've either found in your kitchen cupboards, your gardens, or even on foraging walks to your local woodlands or park. I'm going to go through what we're using today and all of the equipment and ingredients and then I'll have a little bit of a pause just to make sure you've got everything on your table in front of you and then we'll get started. So to begin with we have got some rubber gloves um, it's not a necessity to wear the gloves, um, it depends if you're doing anything after today or tomorrow because it will stain your hands. Um, it does wash off eventually, it's all natural, um, but I just like to tell people this because sometimes, I don't know, you might be going to dinner or meeting with friends and you might not want your nails to be stained. Um, there's also a lot of benefits through natural dyeing and actually touching the ingredients with your skin. Your skin is your largest organ and being able to touch things that are close to nature is really therapeutic and very beneficial for your health. So if there's no other reason why you would like to wear gloves other than you don't want your hands to be stained or you might have sensitive skin, then I would really recommend just using your hands, um, not when we're touching with the hot things, but in the dying process, um, recommend that. What we also have is some tongs. So I'll show you on the bottom screen. Um, that's for with the hot pan. And um, we don't want to be touching anything. We just want to make sure that we're not going to burn our hands or fingers. Um, we've also got some scissors. We've got some twine or heavy duty string. Um, you'll know if it's strong enough if you hold it between both hands and just give it a tug um, and just make sure that it doesn't snap. Um, if it doesn't snap, then you're good to go. Um, and that will work perfectly. What we've also got on the table, um, which was on the ingredients list, is cream of tartar. 
So that's an ingredient that you'll be able to find in your kitchen cupboards or in the baking section at the supermarket. Um, I'll go into more detail about this ingredient after I've gone through what else we have on the table. So I've also got bicarbonate of soda. So that would also be found in the cooking section in the supermarket. I have a lemon, just one lemon or half a lemon will do. Or if you don't have any lemons in the house um, and you've got the bottle of lemon juice, that will work perfectly as well. So in these little bowls, I've got some dried flowers, um, which I've foraged on walks. Um, and I'd recommend if you're going to go foraging for flowers or plants to dye fabric with, um, always take 20% or less of what you found in the first place. Um, it's more beneficial to the ecosystems and you don't want to go in and absolutely take everything. Um, one, it's not very nice for everyone else who wants to enjoy all the flowers. And two, um, there's a lot of insects and bugs that actually need this to survive. So we don't want to be destroying any homes. <laughs> Um, I've also got some other dried flowers. So this specifically is dried hibiscus. Um, you'll find that in loose tea. Um, it smells absolutely amazing. So you'll enjoy working with this. Um, whether you've got it or not, I definitely recommend um, investing in some for next time. I've um, got some onion skins. It's a mixture of white and red. Um, I've mixed them all together. So it's up to you whether you want them together or separate, but we can go through those as well. I've also got some powdered turmeric, and that's in a bowl with a spoon. We don't really want to be touching turmeric because it is just really staying in your hands, um, but it doesn't matter if too much. Um, I've also got some black turtle beans, um, and I don't think this was on the list either, but these you can get from your supermarket um, and or any sort of world food market stores that you might have in the city or in the market stores near where you live. And finally, oh, nearly finally, we've got some red cabbage. Um, I've just chopped it up just into a mixture of fine pieces and some chunky pieces. And I've just put that on a separate chopping board just because uh, the colour is already bleeding quite a bit. So let's keep it separate for now. Um, so on the hob, we've got one pan which is filled with water. Um, not to the top, I would say about halfway full. And then your second pan, it's going to be the same again. It's the one that you're going to have your sieve or your colander in. So I would recommend filling both your saucepans up halfway with water, popping them both on the hob, and you just want to turn them on a low heat. And then we're going to leave them, the one with the saucepan, what we're going to do with the sieve and the colander, I'm just going to move it over so you can see what I've got here. So as you can see, I've got the lid on the pot, and inside is the colander. So I'm just gonna put that on the hob now. And I'm just gonna turn that on a low heat. And you just want the water to start bubbling and you wanna keep the lid on, so you wanna keep all of the steam inside. And we're gonna leave that for quite a while and we'll come back to that pot. And the second one, you're filling halfway with water and you're turning onto a medium high heat so you can get that bubbling fairly quick. And then what we also have is a bowl just with cold water. This is just for us to use in between the stages um, just to make sure that nothing's too hot that we're touching. And finally, your bits of fabric. So I've got two pieces of fabric which I've cut up here. I'm just going to wait a moment before I start nattering again. Just make sure that everyone's got all of their pots on the hob, both filled, half filled with water and on a medium heat. So you just want to get those going while I start talking again. Just give that a minute. Okay, so hopefully you've got both your pots on the pan now. I'm going to talk about the fabric which I have today. So when it comes to natural dyeing, you always want to make sure that the fabrics you're using are natural. So when I say natural, I mean that they haven't been made with synthetic fibres, and they're not man-made, um, and they've grown from the ground. So different examples that you might have today, whether it be a scrap piece of fabric, which is what I have here, you might have an old shirt with you, you might have a dress, some bed linen, a tea towel, Whatever you have, you just want to make sure that it's made of a natural fibre. 
So different examples of fabrics that you could be using today. The go-to is cotton. So if you've got any pieces of cotton lying around in the house or in charity shops, there's a lot of um, dead stock cotton there as well. Um, you've also got organic cotton, which is the better of the two. Um, if you're looking for somewhere to source this from, I'm more than happy to send some links of some fabric suppliers. Um, it's quite hard to source organic cotton secondhand um, because it's quite a new product um, and it's quite popular. So the other fabrics you could have had today are silk. So there's a variety of different types of silk that you can use. Wool is a really great fabric to dye natural dyes with. Um, it soaks up the fabric really, like the dyes really well. So um, if you ever get a chance to get your hands on some wool, I would recommend that as well. Um, the other ones we have are hemp. Hemp is a brilliant fabric. Um, it's really versatile. It's great for making clothes. It's got a great structure to it. And what else do we And viscose. You'll see the word viscose a lot in the clothes that you probably wear. You might have like percent synthetic and then 20 and then 80 percent um viscose and um, viscose is a natural fiber it doesn't sound like it is um i'm not sure why they called it that but um yeah viscose is a natural fiber to use so with the piece of fabric i am just gonna lay it out in front of me and i'm gonna because my piece you might have a square piece and if you do that'll be a lot easier but I'm going to lay mine portrait. So that's just spread out, laid out in front of me, flat on the table in front of you. And you wanna make sure that all your ingredients are close to hand and you're nice and comfortable and ready to start the workshop. So the first ingredient I'm gonna start with before we start moving or before you start dyeing anything, I just want to run through red cabbage with you. So red cabbage is a brilliant vegetable. It's very tasty and it's great for soups. It's also a brilliant dye source. And um, the reason why it's so brilliant is because red cabbage is really sensitive to pH levels. So what I mean is you can add an ingredient that is a high acidic, or you can add an ingredient which is more on the alkaline scale and you'll get a variety of colours just from this one ingredient. And I'll show you a few examples of the colours that you can get. So here is some liquid. This basically is just some red cabbage that I've just boiled for about five minutes. And um, you don't need to do this. I just want to show you as an experiment just so you can see the kind of colours we'll be working with today. So with red cabbage, you're normally going to get like a dark blue colour just when you boil it on its own. Um, today you can kind of see it's really, really dark liquid. Um, it's more on the green side today um, and it will vary depending on the seasons and depending when you've had your red cabbage, when it was delivered. So I've got two glasses here to show you how we're going to shift the colours with red cabbage and how sensitive it is to different ingredients. So the first one we're going to use is lemon. So I've just chopped half a lemon up and I've got the glass in front of me. So a lemon is really high on the acidic level. So you're just gonna see right now, I'm just gonna squeeze it into the glass. And just give that a bit of a swirl. And you see, just like magic, that dark blue green color has gone to a really vibrant hot pink. So we know that when we mix red cabbage with lemon juice, we're going to get a hot pink colour. When we have red cabbage on its own, we're going to have the green blue colour. And the next ingredient we're going to mix it with is bicarbonate of soda. So this is an ingredient that you'll find in all the baking sections in the supermarket um, or in the baking cupboard that you have at home. So I'm just going to get a half a teaspoon or just a teaspoon. And here's the red cabbage. And bicarbonate of soda is an alkaline, so it's on the opposite end of the pH scale to the lemon. So I'm just gonna sprinkle that in. Give it a mix. And that is bubbling. <laughs> it's nearly full to the top. And you can just see as the bubbles are slowly diluting, 
that the colour that we have from this today, normally it would go a yellow. This is the beautiful thing with natural dyes, depending on the season, sometimes they decide to work in marvellous ways. So today we've got like a really, really lovely um, dusky blue colour. So we've got greeny blue, got a dusky blue, or you might have yellow depending on where you got your red cabbage from, if you have them with you today. And then with the lemon, we've got that really bright hot pink colour. So all of these ingredients today are going to make a variety of colours. So we're going to start now with the ingredients that we have in front of us. Right. So just before we start putting all the ingredients on, what we're going to do with our piece of fabric You've got one of your pans, which has been boiling or on the heat for about the five-ish, 10 minutes that I've been talking. With this pan, you're also gonna get the cream of tartar that you have as a second ingredient. Um, so what this ingredient is gonna do for the fabric, it's gonna act as a pre-mordant. And a pre-mordant is the stage that you have to do before you dye fabric with, only if you're using natural dyes. So the reason why we do this is because the fabric um, needs to be coated before it can be dyed to keep the colour to lock in. Um, when you buy fabric or a garment from a shop, um, when it's been made in the factory, each fibre has been coated with a really sort of thin layer of wax on each piece of string that makes and fibre that makes up the piece of fabric. The reason why they cover this in wax is so when they're manufacturing it in the factories, um, their workers don't have loads of fibres flying in the air for them to inhale. Um, the downside of this with natural dyes is that it means that your fabric is probably quite dirty. Even if it doesn't look it, you might have something bright white just like I have. Um, it's still got that layer of wax on it. So what we're going to do with the pre-mordanting stage, we're going to use this ingredient to set the fabric and give it a bit of a clean. And then the natural dyes are going to stick to the fabric and it will be a lot more colour fast, which means that your piece of fabric is going to stay colourful for a lot longer. So I'm just going to put my gloves on. Just because we're going to go near the hot pan. And I'm just going to pick up the cream of tartar that you have. I've got mine in a little cute vintage mug. It is in there. <laughs> so I'm just going to... Depending on how much fabric you have, we're, good. we're doing half a saucepan. So if you've got a top, then I would say about two tablespoons of cream of tartar. If you've got a small piece of fabric like me that you're just testing um, natural dyes with, then I would recommend two small teaspoons. So I'm just going to pop those into the saucepan, which has the hot water in it. So I'm just give it a little stir. Um, you're then going to get your tongs and with your dry piece of fabric, you're just going to pop it into the pan and just make sure that you fully submerged it and give it a little bit of movement. You just want to make sure that all of the fabric is completely coated. Move that over here so you can just see what I'm doing. And I'm just turning it. Just giving it a squeeze just to make sure that all of the liquid and all of the mordant inside is getting into the fibres. So when it comes to pre-mordanting, today we're going to do a quick whistle stop tour. So that means we're just going to submerge it about a minute. And um, what I would recommend when you're doing larger dye projects or you find that this is a suitable medium that you want to explore further in, um, I would definitely recommend that when you're using a mordant to leave the fabric overnight or even a couple of days if you've got enough time to. Um, you're going to get better results if you do this. Um, I would always recommend natural dyeing is quite a slow process and it's all about enjoying unlocking the sort of secrets that Mother Nature gives you. So there's not really any rush um, unless you've got a deadline or maybe some coursework or if that you want to make someone um, it doesn't affect it too much but you're going to get better results if you're a bit more patient so 
you've got the piece of fabric in your saucepan, which has been boiling. You can now turn that saucepan off. I'm going to completely turn it off. And your second saucepan, which is still been bubbling away, keep that on. I'm going to keep that on until I say so, which will be in a little while. So with your tongs and your cold bowl of water, I would just place your piece of fabric that has been submerged in the solution into the cold bowl. And you're just going to let that sit. Okay. And the reason why we're popping it in the cold water is just to cool it down a bit more quicker so we can get stuck into the dyeing process. Um, normally, like I said, if you leave it overnight, by the time you get back, your fabric's gonna be cold anyway. So this is just because we're just going through each process step by step. So I'm just gonna dip my finger in and the water is nice and cold and the fabric's cooled down as well. So I'm just gonna squeeze the fabric in the bowl, just rinse all of the excess water out. And it's good to work with damp fabric as well when it comes to dyeing and with natural dyes. So I'm just squeezing all of that out. Let's give it one last shake. I'm just gonna pop out on the side. So I'm just gonna unfold our piece of fabric. It's not gonna look any different. It's gonna look exactly the same, but I promise you the magic has happened inside. So, like I said previously, we're just gonna lie that flat in front of us. If your piece is square, that's great. If you've got a garment that you're working on or a pillowcase, um, I would always lie everything portrait. Right. So I'm gonna take my gloves off now because uh, this is the stage where we're gonna to touch the ingredients. Um, like I previously mentioned at the beginning of the workshop, um, it's really beneficial for your health and it's very therapeutic to um, touch natural things with your hands. Your skin is your largest organ um, and it's really beneficial to soak up nutrients from the ground and from mother nature. Um, like a lot of the clothes that we wear are dyed with chemicals um, and it says a lot about the way that things are manufactured in the textile and fashion industry. So opting for things that are a little bit more gentle and a bit more kinder are really beneficial um, just all round for the environment, for yourself and your health and for your skin. So I'm going to start with the largest ingredient first and mine is the red cabbage because I've chopped it up quite chunky. So I'm just going to begin by placing it onto the fabric and there's no right or wrong way with how you're going to be displaying this. Um, I would just recommend that with your biggest ingredients first you just want to make, make sure that they're evenly spaced out. So I normally start with each corner and just sort of work my way out. Once you've had fun with this first sample, I would really recommend that you get stuck in and try different variations of different ingredients. Um, like I said, there's no um, definitive right or wrong way with how you're going to place the ingredients down or um, in which order you're going to place your ingredients down, because I'm sure we all probably have loads of different ingredients in front of us right now. Um, you just want to make sure that they're all going to be evenly spread out and that you're going to have lots of fun as well because it looks really great and it smells amazing. Um, if this is something that you're using for a project, um, whether it be at school or college or uni, um, I'd recommend like throughout each process just taking pictures um, or do it next time that you have more time for you to sit down and document each process because sometimes it's quite nice to see oh like this time I used onion skins and red cabbage and I got this colour and then so on and so on with the other techniques you might be doing. So I'm going down next with some onion skins and I'm using white and red and I've let these dry out in a separate pot. I've got a big pot in the kitchen um, where I just sort of put all my onion skins in and also have some friends that have restaurants so if you know anyone in the catering industry and um, that chops onions quite a lot i'm sure they'll be grateful for you to take all the onion skins off their hands <laughs> so as you can see i am just evenly placing each piece 
onto the fabric, going all the way out to the edges. And I'm gonna start working my way into the smaller ingredients now. The last ingredient I'm going to use, which is the smallest, is the turmeric. So we don't want to touch that just yet. So next I'm going on to some flowers that I've foraged. So we've got some roses, got some dandelions, which you'll get an abundance of anywhere you are. Got some lavender, which smells amazing. And some chrysanthemums. It's always great if um, you ever get presents, um, which are flowers, <laughs> because not only are they beautiful and look great in the house, they actually serve a purpose after if you're practicing um, natural dyes, because you can keep all of them. If you're ever getting a bundle of flowers and you need to dry them out because you're going to start naturally dyeing, I'll always recommend that you tie the uh, flowers up and you hang them upside down. It's the best way to dry flowers and it also means that they don't droop. So you're just going to keep working with gravity. You're going to hang them upside down and just tie them to a table leg or a chair. So I've just laid down my petals. What I'm going to go for next is the dried hibiscus. So I'm not sure what other ingredients you might be using, but dried hibiscus is um, a flower which is really, really great in it's just used in so many different things. I'm just trying to <laughs> rag my brain. So it's used in medicine, it's used in food, and um, you're probably quite familiar with it in tea um, from all over the world. And it does grow natively to the UK in some flower farms. But you're probably best off with um, either getting it from a local flowers market or the dried stuff which I buy uh, in bulk. Um, you can get online um, and to pop it on. So all of the ingredients are nice and spread out. So another one which I've got here are black turtle beans. And they're dried, so they don't come in the tin. Um, the ones that come in the tin are already soaked and they've already had the color extracted from them. So if you're ever gonna experiment with black turtle beans or black beans or anything from the bean family, I would just recommend that you buy them dried. So I'm just going to sprinkle these on top, just in between some of the gaps that look like they need more ingredients. And it smells amazing. So the final ingredient that I have on the table today is turmeric. Um, turmeric is from a root of a tree and they harvest the root to make really beautiful shades of yellow and orange, which is used in cooking, um, especially in the Middle East. Um, with turmeric, it's a really strong pigment. So you're never going to need more than just the tip of a teaspoon. You want to be really sort of stingy with how much you're putting on. Unless you want your piece to be really yellow, um, then go for it. But if you're experimenting with a variety of ingredients today or next time, um, then I would recommend that you just sort of use a little bit. So I'm just going to sprinkle just the tip of the teaspoon just into some of the gaps which are lacking some ingredients. And once we've got everything laid out, we've also got the red cabbage, whether you've got red cabbage with you today or not, um, just for next time or when you're deciding to try this process out. Everything's laid out now and the red cabbage is dotted over in certain areas. I can see where it is on the fabric. I'm now gonna go back with my lemon. So as we saw previously, if we add red cabbage with lemon, we're gonna get a vibrant hot pink color. So on some areas, I'm just going to squeeze some lemon juice. And then the other ingredient we used was the bicarbonate of soda. So what we saw with this ingredient was we got more of a dusky blue. And you might have gotten yellow or green from your red cabbage with bicarbonate of soda. Um, it all depends on the season that you've got your cabbage in. So what I'm going to do next is same, just like the turmeric, just get the tip of a teaspoon. I'm just going to sprinkle just on a couple of areas where the red cabbage is. Lovely. 
Okay, so once you're happy and your piece of fabric is sufficiently covered um, from all sides to the edges, we're going to begin by rolling our fabric up. So the reason why I mentioned to have everything laid out in portrait is because you're going to be rolling up and it makes it a lot easier than rolling to the side. So you just want to make it as comfortable as possible. So what I'm going to start by doing with my piece of fabric is just folding over the first end about an inch and just squishing that down. And we're going to start rolling with both hands. If you have a piece of fabric or a garment or whatever you're working on, I'd recommend that while you're rolling up, you're going to be tucking the edges on the right and left side. You tuck them into themselves at the same time as you roll. So just take it nice and slow. You want to make sure the tension is nice and tight and that your ingredients are going to stay nice and secure in the fabric. So I'm just slowly rolling and as I go along, I'm just tucking each edge. I'm tucking each edge. The reason that I'm doing this um, is to make sure that the colour is evenly dispersed um, and that your fabric, uh, your ingredients that you put on your fabric don't fall out of the end um, after you've rolled it up. So I'm just going to slowly keep on rolling. Um, depending what your hand-eye coordination is like, when I first started doing this process, it's a little bit tricky and it does take a bit of patience. Just going to take it nice and slowly. Make sure you're keeping that tension nice and tight. Just checking each time, just giving it a bit of a squeeze and making sure that your edges are keeping tucked in. So I'm just coming towards the end. And you'll know that your tension has rolled out quite nicely. So you can let go and your piece of fabric is going to stay still and all the ingredients are going to stay there. Um, sometimes if you've overfilled it, it might start unraveling. Um, I would just sort of give it a squeeze or just take a couple of things out if needs be. But you just want to make sure that the tension is nice and even and that none of your ingredients are going to fall out if you're holding it like this. So the next stage is making sure that this piece of fabric is bound together so that our ingredients stay nice and secure while we're cooking the fabric. I've got a little, here's one I made earlier. So this is what we're achieving. We're going to have our twine. So you can see mine. So with your twine or heavy duty string, I would always just measure the length of your little sausage that you rolled up. Just get the length of your string and I would say about four times the length. So I'm just going to go to one end, go back on itself. I'm just going to loop that over four times. And then I'm just going to cut the end with my scissors. So we have our piece of string and on the table in front of us, we have our piece of fabric which has been rolled up and has all of our ingredients inside. So what we're going to do with your more dominant hand, you're going to hold your piece of fabric which you rolled up so you want to have enough movement that you can sort of move it around if you're working with a bigger piece of fabric or a garment um good luck <laughs> and also it's great um if you've got a friend to help you if you're working with really big pieces um sometimes when i do like duvet covers um it's a bit of a workout so it's great when you've got someone to hold it and then someone to wrap it but you're going to hold it with your more dominant hand and then with your other hand, so for my case, that's my left hand, you're just going to hold down the first piece of string with your thumb. And you're, with your other hand, you're just going to start wrapping just to the top fairly liberally and all the way back down to the bottom. And the first piece is just to make sure that your fabric is secure. And then if you've got any left over, I would just go back on yourself and just make sure that if there's any really big gaps in between that you're just going to fill them up with string um, and sometimes if you're lucky enough you'll find the other end and you can tie just one knot and um, if not then just tuck it into itself um, or to a second piece of string which you've had under there so we've got our sausage here which is great and you can already see 
all of the colour which is coming out of mine. Um, lots of blues and pinks and some greens, which is definitely probably from the red cabbage. What we're going to do next is we're going to cook the fabric. So the pot that you've had steaming with the lid on and your colander or sieve inside, um, we're going to pop our gloves on and make sure that we don't burn our hands. So our piece of fabric is already quite damp from when we did the pre mordanting stage. If you weren't to do that because um, you'd left it overnight and your fabric's dry, I would just recommend just plopping the sausage that you rolled out in that bowl of water just very quickly. Give it a bit of a squeeze and with your tongs you're just going to open up the lid. You're just going to open up the lid of your pan and you're popping your piece of fabric into the saucepan. And you want to make sure that your sausage that you've rolled up is just on the edge of the water, so it's not submerged. That's the reason why we have the sieve and the colander in there, is to separate your piece of fabric from the water. So with the lid on, the steam is gonna rise and it's gonna go through your fabric and it's gonna make the color pop out a lot more. So pop my gloves off. I'll just give you a couple of minutes if you're just a couple of steps. If you're still rolling your fabric or if you're just sorting out your hob and popping it in. So what we're going to do next while we've got our piece of fabric in on the stove, we're going to leave it steaming for about 10 minutes. Um, I'd always recommend 10 to 15 minutes. You don't really need to do any more unless you're working with like a really big piece of fabric. Um, and we're going to have a little interlude. I think Annabelle's going to pop on shared screen. Um, lovely. And we're going to have a little introduction to me and what I do. So, my background is in textiles. Um, I studied art at school and I did, yeah, art at school. And then college, I did the national art diploma. So the diploma specialized in all aspects of art. So the first year was um, like painting, textiles, photography, digital art, and you sort of find your sort of beat on where you want to sort of land creatively. Once I'd done that, um, I then, on my second year of college, decided to specialise in textile design because it was my favourite medium to work with. Um, always had lots of fun with it and that's where it took me. So during college, I was specialising in embroidery and um, felting fabric. Um, it was still lots of things that were very tactile. Um, I've always really liked things that, I don't know, that feel good. Um, if you see something, you just want to touch it. That's the kind of things that I'm attracted to creatively. So from college I then decided to go to university and study textile design in its entirety. Um, I just wanted to know everything about it. I was quite curious um, about where it would lead me and I went to Norwich University of the Arts. Um, while I was at Norwich Uni I was still specialising in embroidery and I then found sort of a new kind of love which was in screen printing and that's where you mix up colours and you work with a big board frame and you can print your own drawings and designs onto fabric. Um, through doing this I learned how to mix colours um, like a lot more professionally than what I sort of knew before from like the colour scale. Um, I specialised in colour theory and learning a lot more of the meanings that come in with different colours. I've got um, a couple of books here which um, are definitely my Bibles which I use even after my studies. So one of them is The Secret Lives of Colour um, and it's just stories about colours and the history of colour um, and it's really really lovely. It's always really nice to know where colours come from, the stories behind them, um, it's great to have um, like a narrative behind your work um, 
because people like to understand like who you are creatively if you want to talk about certain things um, and it's great to engage with other people um, about who you are and what you like doing. I'd recommend like if you are in your studies or if you're looking to study um, to try not to turn a blind eye to the subjects that might not interest you as much. Um, ironically when I was in school I really didn't like science. I never went to science class um, well, and I just, it just wasn't something, I wasn't very interested and I couldn't really sort of pick up on it. Um, I really try to put myself in the mindset of liking it and trying to just look at different subjects that weren't just creative because we find inspiration from all around us. And it's quite ironic that now I'm specifically working with colour um, and with like pH scales in colour and it's all quite scientific. Um, so it's quite ironic that the topic I least liked is now something that's feeding into what I'm doing creatively. So I would always recommend that's something that you always embrace and try and not turn a blind eye to all the subjects you're looking at. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so at uni I was doing textiles and then I was printmaking. And through that I started learning about dyeing fabric um, with all different sort of chemical dyes. And it was through that that I started getting a bit frustrated that I was using a lot of chemicals and just sort of throwing them away at every session. Um, I did some research and it's natural dyes is a really, really ancient technique. Um, it was used before all of our ancestors. Um, all of the costumes and paintings that you see in museums have all been dyed with natural dyes. They stand the test of time. They, they don't have like, they're not made with chemicals. So they're not always going to be as colour fast, but they are brilliant and they're great for the planet. And they're a lot more economical um, when you're working in your sort of design studio. You want to make sure that what you're producing is, you know, you, you don't want to be wasting um, through your creative process, especially with where we are right now with the climate and how we're all trying to do our bit to help. I think you should always reflect on what you're doing and like how conscious you are towards your fashion and textile choices. Whether you shop in fast fashion places um, such as high street shops, um, I'd recommend, you know, if, if, you're, if you do like following trends, then I'd recommend looking at apps such as like Depop or Vinted. It's all secondhand things, um, but you can still find like the latest trends in there. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not contributing to a society that is going to be more damaging to where we're looking at in the long run um, and practicing different things you know whether it's creative or in your personal life I think always just sort of going back and being very conscious and thinking okay what damage am I doing or how wasteful am I being and seeing how you can better yourselves and educate your friends and family as well it's, it's great to start these conversations um, so yes, yeah, so through colour theories, you can see in some of those pictures, I've also got another book, which is something that I live by, and that's the language of flowers. Um, each flower has a story, has got history behind it. Um, this little book has little poems, and that also goes back to storytelling with your work. Um, I think flowers are so poetic and really romantic as well. Like. And that's how it's sort of fed into sort of me going into sort of bridal wear and telling love stories through fabric and through colour. Um, I have a lot of people in, um, so like weddings, like the bride will give me their flowers and I'll use those flowers to then dye some fabric. So their wedding bouquet has then been turned into a piece of fabric, which can then be a keepsake for them. And they hold a lot of meaning and working with bridal wear and in the bridal industry, it was a kind of personal mission of mine because the wedding industry is extremely wasteful. It's an a billion dollar industry, what dollar, pounds, whatever. <laughs> um, it's extremely wasteful and it's all just for one day. Um, people buy so much and like I said, it's just for one day. It's really damaging. And I think we need to start unpicking what we think is traditional and what we think is deemed as like you know if, if it's a tradition then maybe try and find like a, an alternative that's a bit more eco-friendly so um tables so when it comes to napkins and linens 
Um, I offer a service where you can hire them, so you don't have to buy loads of new ones just to then get rid of all of them. Um, you want to make sure you're upcycling things and regenerating and just being more conscious about the actions that you have on the planet. So that's the main thing that I tackled was wedding dresses for a while. Um, you buy your dress, you wear it, and then you chuck it in a cupboard, and then you're never going to see it. Maybe you'll hand it down to a family member, or maybe it will just sit there collecting dust until one day it's then donated. So all of the dresses that were donated or vintage, um, I sort of scour and I collect. So I sort of took it on as a personal mission to um, get all of the dresses that I thought were beautiful and that I thought still had a lot of life in them. Um, there was definitely a lot in there that were really dated. Um, the 80s is a bit of a bit of a weird era with uh, lots of big puffy sleeves, all the big hair. And so those ones were a bit harder to upcycle because they have a lot going on. Um, but there was a lot of dresses that I found, um, as you can see in the images, which have then been upcycled using the dye process. So I either upcycle them and just sell them as they are, um, whether they're just garments or actual wedding dresses. Or what I have done is someone will give me their dress and I can dye it for them. Um, sometimes I dip dye them, which is quite cool. Um, and it then means that it doesn't feel like their wedding dress anymore. It's like a new garment that they can then start to love all over again. Because it is something that makes you feel very special. Um, and you want to continue that. And you don't want to waste all of that love and probably money that you spent on it as well. Um, so a few of the pictures that you're seeing now are from a recent collection. These have all been dyed using the processes that we've done today, um, all from natural ingredients, natural pigments, rolling the fabric up and steaming it. I have massive pots that I do the dresses in instead of little saucepans, but saucepans are great for the samples that we're doing today. So I've also got a few other things to show you. So with dresses, there's some recent ones that I've done with uh, that process. So this is a little silk slip dress and that has been hand dyed using rose petals and it's really lovely and soft. It's a really nice one. And if you are currently studying, uh, just a few points and tips on things that you can use your samples with. So when I have a creative process or I'm making something for someone in mind, or for a project um, at school, college, or uni. Um, I am quite a visual person, um, so I like doing things with my hands, like I mentioned before. Um, so when it comes to, like, um, like you might be more on the digital side of things and you want to might, might want to make a digital mood board, but if you're into more sort of boarded mood boards, then I just sort of go through the process of what I normally do for each dress when I'm talking with a customer. So on the back, I've got pictures of the dresses um, that they give to me or ones that I rescued from a charity shop. And I'll just sort of lay out pictures. So when you're going to make a mood board, I'd always recommend that if you're going to have lots of square lines, so if it's rectangled or uh, square shapes or like little samples like I have here and um, it's always easier on the eye if you have everything laid out in a grid formation um, so you don't want anything sort of sticking out or you want to keep it nice and grid and it's quite uniform um, that kind of structure is more informative so if you're trying to just sort of um, tell someone without even having to speak to them what you're doing um, it's one of the best ways just to sort of communicate something visually the other side is um, an illustration of the dress and what will sort of happen to it, like where it will be dyed. And all the samples next to it are the colours that we would work with. So you can see again, it's that grid formation. We'll keep it in a square. And if you are going to be doing this, then when you lay everything out, you always want to make sure that the space at the top of your mood board is always about a centimetre bigger than the space at the bottom of your board. And it's just the way that your eyes sit when you look at it visually, um, you just need to move everything just down just by a centimetre. So that's with mood boards. And then with all your samples and the pieces that you're going to be making with your natural dyes, you can turn these into projects. So some pieces that I normally make are purses. 
so as you can see it's a little patchwork purse and I think they've got a workshop coming up which is um, quilting so maybe you should join that and have a look at how you can quilt some of the samples that you've dyed. Um, there's an old Japanese um, belief that you should never throw away a piece of fabric that is any bigger than a bean <laughs> because they think that is it can still be used and I think that's really quite beautiful that um, it, it just really sort of ties in with the whole um, no waste kind of ethos. Um, and what we also have is some books. So with my samples, I normally have a colour book. So you can see on the second screen there, I'll just do a little flick through so you can see the colours that are in here. So it's like a variety of all the different colours that you can achieve with natural dyes. Um, it's kind of like my natural dye bible that I sort of refer to. Um, and it's a nice and neat way for me to um, bring to people and sort of show them what I'm all about. Um, like I said, it's great to have physical things that you can show people. Um, it's also great to have online as well. So I've got a digital copy, which I send out to people. Um, and yeah, so when you're communicating your work to people, um, you want to do it in a way that's quite clear. So if it's through colour or illustrations, then mood boards are brilliant and any like digital form like a PowerPoint or like a PDF and um, that you can sort of make a poster about all of your work. I definitely recommend that. So while I've been nattering, I'm going to have a bit of water. Your piece of fabric should have been steaming now for about 10, 10 ish minutes, I think. I don't know how long I was talking for. Um, so I'm just going to pop my gloves on. And you should probably see your piece of fabric is probably already cooking up some lovely colours. So I'm just going to pop the lid off and you can turn your hob off now. So I'm just going to turn the heat completely off. And um, while you're taking the lid off, just be mindful um, that you've been steaming it for quite a while. So open the lid facing away from you because you don't want a big gust of steam coming up in your face. Um, that'd be very fun. So with your tongs, you're just gonna pick up your piece of fabric and you're gonna plop it in the bowl of cold water. Okay. So I'm going to take my gloves off. Move my books out of the way so I don't want them getting wet. Just want to make sure your piece of fabric's cooled down before you touch it. So I'm just going to turn mine over and I'm pretty happy with that. It's cooled down fairly quickly. So I'm just going to find where that edge is of string. And I'm just going to start unraveling it. And if you've got all your ingredients that are bulging out of the sides, um, just let them fall into the bowl of water that you've got underneath you. And if your fabric's still a bit too hot, then just give it a couple of minutes. Here we are. So I've taken the string off. I'm now just going to start unraveling the fabric. And you can see all the ingredients are starting to fall out. And it smells amazing. And the fun thing with natural dyeing is that every time you do this, it's going to be completely different. So it's like making a present to yourself from yourself um, of just glorious colour. So I'm just going to make sure that all of that's sort of shaken off. I'm just going to hold that up for you. You can see all of those lovely colours. So we've got yellow, we've got green, we've got pink, we've got red, we've got purple, we've got a whole rainbow of colours. So with your piece of fabric, you're going to leave it to dry. So I'd hang it somewhere um, that is going to be okay, preferably outside. Um, it's quite nice and sunny where I am. I'm not sure where it is, what it's like where you are. Um, but if you just sort of hang it up, if you're hanging it up indoors, um, just make sure you've got a tea towel on the floor because it's going to drip a little bit and you don't 
want to get some lots of colour on your floor. So you're going to leave it to go completely dry. So you'll leave that until tomorrow morning. And once you've done that, you're going to have a piece of fabric just like this. So here's one I did earlier, <laughs> which is nice and dry. Um, and later, the aftercare of your fabric um, is quite important. So you always want to make sure that you're going to wash it once it's completely dried. And you're going to wash it with cold water and with just a drop of gentle laundry detergent. If you haven't got any gentle laundry detergent, just use a drop of your dishwashing uh, fairy liquid that you might have in the house. Um, all eco products I celebrate. Um, you just want to make sure that you're not using anything that's um, got too many, too many chemicals in it. So what you can also do, just so you can be certain that it depends what you want to use your fabric for. So what I sometimes do, I'll cut a strip off the end of my dry piece of fabric um, and I'll wash one half and I'll keep the other half dry and then I can see how it comes out after it's washed. Um, that'll be great for your uh, books um, with any of your studies and um, just so you can use that as like a colour reference and sometimes you don't want to wash it and um, if you want to frame it or maybe use it for a cushion or something and um, that's not going to need washing quite a lot then you don't always need to wash it you might have some colours that you really like in there um, and sometimes they can dull a little bit depending on how many ingredients you use. So yeah, I think that is everything. I've made a lot of mess, which is great. It's always great having lots of colour. Um, I'd love to see if you've been following along um, what sort of other sort of pieces you've made um, and the colours you've created from your kitchens. Great. I've just put in the message that if anyone would like to share what they've done today, um, if you just message us in the chat function and say, yes, we will um, turn on your video. I hope everyone had fun and there were no burnt hands. <laughs> I'll make sure everyone had a good time. <laughs> That's cool. It's quite quiet at the moment. So what I might do is I might just say my kind of outro sh spiel um, and then there'll be a time for questions because I've just seen um, a question. We'll ask a question now. It says, can you use... Oh, we've got people participating now. Okay, so first question is, can you use old dry flowers? And then I will also let someone show their video. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would actually recommend using dried flowers. Um, you can use fresh flowers and they work really well. Um, but I prefer using dried flowers because actually when they dry, it locks in the colour for longer. Um, and it also means that you can enjoy your flowers in the house as decorations for a bit longer and then once they're dried you can then use them for dyeing. Um, if you're going to dry flowers from fresh I'd recommend that you tie the stalks up and you hang them upside down from a table or a chair and you leave them to go completely dry. It normally takes about a week or two weeks and um, to completely dry flowers out. The reason why you hang them upside down is so um, like when gravity pulls down like normally you'd have a flower and you see in the vase and they get a bit sad and they droop um, you just want to keep that structure so then you can pick all the petals off which would be, which is very satisfying. So um, yeah, long story long, you can use dried flowers. <laughs> and then they said even if it's dried for over a year, mm -hmm. does it matter in the time frame? Yeah, it depends on the flowers that you use. Like I've had someone come with a, a wedding bouquet before and they'd had it dried for a couple of years. And um, some flowers do really retain their pigments and roses are really great for that. Um, it all depends on the kind of flowers that you've had kept for a couple of years. I'd, um, yeah, just experiment and um, have some fun. That's great. Before I go on to the other questions, we've got Gwen Francis here just showing her oh. work. I'll turn on your, um, your audio as well. Oh. Um, Gwen, one second. Oh, that's really lovely, Gwen. It looks like a painting. You see some really pretty sort of markings on there. Ah, oh, thanks. Yeah, I had, I really enjoyed it. 
really, really lovely. That's great. It's beautiful. Really mm -hmm. beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks. Cool. Um, I've got another question. Um, so when you modern your fabric overnight, does it need to be in warm water, like on the hob all the time? Question mark. So I would have it heating on the hob like we did earlier. Um, I would keep it on a low heat for 30 minutes and then I'll turn it completely off and leave it off for the entire night. You never want to leave any pans on while you're going to bed um, or throughout the night and you want to save on your electricity as well and gas. <laughs> Great, so what I'll do is I'll just say my end bit and then we can see if any more questions come through. If that's all right, so if you just give me one second. Oh yeah, and um, if you're, I think everything's tagged in with the PowerPoint, but my Instagram is Mia Sylvia, and my website is miasylvia.co.uk. So um, come and say hey. <laughs> Okay, so thank you everyone for taking part and joining the session with us today. So before we finish up, I just want to remind you that we have many more workshops across our summer school programme. Um, so these cover a huge range of practices, including designing album covers, expressive painting, and next week there is actually one called Something From Nothing, which looks at creating visual concepts and ideas for a new fashion and culture publication so that might be something that you're interested in if you are interested in kind of textiles and fashion stuff like that um, so these workshops give you an insight into lots of different areas that your creativity could take you and the many job opportunities that exist so if you haven't already you can book your place on the website and we will send you a link in the chat function we are also offering you the opportunity to receive an official NUA certificate, which is great to talk about on any personal um, statement, like your UCAS personal statement you might be putting together. Um, so to get hold of one of these certificates, you'll need to attend six out of the 12 workshops that we're offering. And we would like to see your outcomes from at least three of these workshops. So you can send your three outcomes to us by email, and that is at student.recruitment at nua.ca ac.uk but we'll put that in the chat function later as well um, so these outcomes can be something you've made as part of the workshop or something you've made afterwards in response to the workshops themselves um, we also really want to see what you're making throughout the summer school series so do tag us in any of your photos of your workshop outcomes on instagram which is at NUA outreach and also with me and Sylvia so hopefully yep yeah, it's on um, my screen at the moment that's at me and Sylvia with two a's um, so it'll be great to share some of your favorite pieces of work throughout the series um, we will be launching a poll in a second with a couple of questions now just for some feedback but each week we'll also be able to be giving away one NUA chilies bottle so all you have to do to be in the chance of winning this is to complete the feedback form that we'll be sending you via email at the end of the week so there's lots of chances to win um, and lastly one project to mention is we're also running a community quilting project in response to COVID-19 pandemic so please create a 17 by 17 centimetre patch and submit to anyway's postal address. Um, like Mia said, that could involve the piece that you've created today, but it's really anything that you would like to submit. So that's something to think about as well. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll put the addresses in the chat function that we've mentioned, and we'll just hang around for a few moments to ask any more questions, if anyone else would like to share their work with us as well. So thank you again for everyone. To participate and we will have a look at the chat function. So currently we just have a thank you <laughs> um, for oh, the workshop. Well. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. So I'm going to just launch that poll that I just said. So I should launch that. Maybe. 
it's already launched. Um, but does anyone else have any questions? So please um, do put them in the chat function. We've just got another thank you. You're welcome. To be fair, you explained everything so well, step by step. <laughs> um, like I could follow it really well. Oh, oh we've got you. another. Oh, we've got some more questions now. Okay, so firstly, do you have any other natural dye recommendations? Um, yes. Uh, if you're looking for things locally, then you can use nettles, and there's an abundance of those. Just make sure you're wearing gloves and just snip off just the very top bit. You don't need any of the leaves at the bottom. Um, Anything that you can find in your woodland, uh, any flowers that have colour in them, um, I'd recommend giving them a go. Um, in your kitchen cupboard, there's also avocado stones and skins that work really well. Um, I'd give them a go. Um, you're more than welcome to drop me a message um, and also have a look on my Instagram because um, I talk quite a bit about different ingredients you can use and um, different websites that you can get them from. There's a few companies um, that I get some natural dyes from um, that you can't source in the UK. So it's quite good to note with other colours. Thank you. Um, um, can you use the cabbage juice to dye the fabric with too? Yeah, yeah, definitely. If you've got more fabric left over, um, like the glasses that I have here, what I'm going to do with these now, I'm going to put some ribbons in them so I can uh, use the colour that I've made and dye some more fabric. Thank you. I don't have any more questions that have come through at the moment. So we'll just hang around for a bit and see if anyone has any more questions. A little bit long, thank you. Everyone's saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, thank you. I got so can I dip balls of wool into the glasses? So I suppose that's like the dye from the cabbage, the water. You said, Can you dip balls of wool into it? You can, um, it depends, um, how you've treated your wool, um, like when we did the pre mordanting stage. Um, if you want to make sure that it's more colour fast, then I'd recommend soaking the wool first in your pre mordanted solution before you then dye it. Um, so if you've got your saucepan still, which has your mordant in, then you can dip the wool in and leave it to soak and then pop it in your cabbage dye after. And show me if you are going to do that. I'd love to see some of that. It'd be really nice. She says, thank you, I will. So hopefully you'll see some results <laughs> soon. Um, I, I, have, I know a few designers that um, specialise. I'm, I'm guessing if you're working with wool in a ball, you might be a weaver or knitter. Um, so I've got some designers and friends um, that specialise in natural dyes with weaving. Um, that could be interesting to look at because they go through the process of how to unravel the wool and how to ravel it back up again. Because um, you want to keep it nice and neat if you're weaving. Thank you. Um, we have a question regarding the fabric because I know you obviously you took you spoke quite a bit about using natural fibres, but this question is saying what if your fabric says it's eighty percent cotton and then twenty percent synthetic? So I suppose a lot of the fabric like leftovers it's quite a mix, isn't it now? Mm -hmm. So can so you use that? You can use that, um, and it will work. Um, it won't be as colour fast as one hundred percent cotton. Um, but I wouldn't rule it out, like I would still use it. Um, the fabrics that I have on my scrap pack are sometimes a mixture of synthetics because I normally get bundles of um, dead stock fabrics or clothes donated um, or I get them from charity shops and they will normally consist of a little bit. The only downside with working with fabric like that, even buying fabric like that from shops, is when you mix two fibres, like, so one that's synthetic and one that's natural, it can't then be recycled because they can't take apart the fibres. Um, so that's something to be mindful with when you're shopping for clothes or textiles. So maybe look like it's actually more beneficial to buy something that's 100% polyester or synthetic um, because it can actually be recycled after, whereas the blended ones can't actually be recycled. So yeah, you can, but it won't be as great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Oh, can you use berries? You can use berries, yeah. So it depends on the berries you use. Um, some that I've tried before, like raspberries, um, they do work and they make a really soft pink colour. The reason why it's not as strong as the colour that you actually see that they are is because they have, hold a lot of water in them. Um, so some of the berries that you'll find on trees and bushes, um, make sure that you Google or do your Google Lens or do some research before you start picking berries um, and wear gloves as well. Um, but a lot of berries that you sort of find in the UK um, are really strong pigments and uh, blackberries and blueberries work really well. That's great. What's the favourite ingredient that you like to use like colour wise? Do you have something that you like your go to or your favourite? Yeah, rust, rust using tools and yeah, rust dyeing is my favourite. Yeah, so I get metal from um, beaches and if, yeah, if you follow onto my Instagram, I've, I've got a workshop releasing soon on the IGTV section and that will be a tutorial of how to dye with rusted tools. So um, keep an eye out for that as well. So interesting, thank you. <laughs> okay so if there are no more questions what I'll do is I'll probably finish the session because it's gone quite quiet now so I just want to say thank you Mia for running the yeah. workshop today it's been really great yeah. um, really really good um and thank you everyone for coming today and participating so hopefully if you share your work with us it'll be really interesting to see what you've produced um we're really excited to see it so thank you everyone and like i said thank you mia um people are saying thank you so much now so thank you from You're everyone welcome. <laughs> and what i'll do is i'll finish the session now okay thank you Bye bye, bye.